Today we're going to be taking a look at one of the most beautiful tactical sequences that Bobby Fischer has ever played. It features a stunning queen sacrifice that is really something to behold. The combination of board vision and sheer imagination with which Fischer was able to bring down such swift and unexpected destruction upon his opponent, as if through sheer tyranny of will, is truly astounding. And it's something that we chess players all dream of doing. I have yet to play so brilliantly, and I probably never will, but stick around to the end of this video because I'm going to show you a lost opportunity from one of my own games that you just might find even more dazzling than the winning combination that Fischer played in this game, which is from round 8 of the Leipzig Olympiad of 1960. Bobby Fischer has the black pieces. He's up against the Chilean champion, international master René Letelier Martner, who opens up the game with d4. To which the 17-year-old Bobby Fischer replies knight to f6, and after c4, he goes for his beloved King's Indian defense with the move g6, preparing to fianchetto the bishop, and intending to activate his light squared bishop with the move d6. And this was Bobby's all-time favorite defense against the queen's pawn opening, although he did play e6 quite a bit here too. Next comes knight to c3, after which black can still contest the center with the move d5, known as the Grunfeld, but Bobby plays bishop to g7, sticking to the king's Indian, which of course allows white to grab the big scary pawn trio with e4, which, if you believe modern day engines, does give white a non-trivial advantage. But if white is to maintain that advantage into the middle game, he's going to need specialist knowledge or an extreme amount of talent, especially when facing the ultimate King's Indian specialist, Bobby Fischer, who knows this opening like the back of his hand and who now responds with a slightly provocative move, castling kingside. A little more normal here is the move d6, discouraging white from playing e5, but here Bobby is just inviting it. And this is a very instructive position because it really highlights the difference between amateur and master level play. If you take a look at the Lee Chess database of master level games, you'll see that e5 is very rarely played in only about 1% of the games. But in the database of online games from players of all rating levels, e5 is actually the most popular move. So that's a pretty striking difference. It seems that the amateurs are looking at e5 and saying, hell yeah, push that pawn, grab that space, and kick that knight. And if I didn't know better, I'd probably play it too. But this move e5, which was played by Rene in the game, pretty much equalizes the position. White has gained some space, but his pawns are a little overextended and have lost some of their dynamic potential, which was at its greatest when they were three abreast in the center on c4, d4, and e4. Now e5 does force the knight to retreat to an inferior square, Bobby drops it back to e8, but in the process he's activated another piece by opening the diagonal of his dark squared bishop. And for the moment he is still ahead in piece development, having the bishop on g7 and having castled as opposed to white who just has the knight on c3. And his overambitious pawn center, which black is going to try to argue wasn't worth the tempi it took to achieve. But Rene is not done pushing pawns, and he now continues with pawn move number 5, with f4. He's come this far, he might as well bolster that pawn center even further, and this move is fine, knight to f3 is a playable alternative, but either way, it's a roughly equal position. Bobby now continues d6, biting at that center, while opening a diagonal for his light squared bishop. We have bishop to e3 from Rene, to which Bobby replies c5, which is very principled. Anytime you're in a situation where your opponent has amassed a big proud pawn center, if you just start attacking it with your pawns, there's a good chance you're going to be on the right path. Even if you sacrifice a little material, as Bobby did here. Since after d takes c5, now played by Rene, there is no capturing the pawn on c5 or on e5 unless black wants to lose his queen, since this d6 pawn is pinned. So this is a pawn sacrifice, but it's one that is totally justified after Bobby's next move knight to c6, just developing with more pressure on the e5 pawn. And if white wants to trade off this pawn, he's going to get into some trouble, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. Rene plays c takes d6, nothing wrong with that, it is a good move, but after e takes d6 from Bobby, if white were to now play e takes d6, then he's actually completely lost after bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3, and knight takes d6. When white is left with a hideous queenside pawn structure, only a single piece developed, his king's in the center, while black's king is safely castled with rook to e8 on the way, 
Need I say more? So in the game, Rene, realizing that e takes d6 will lead to his swift demise, instead plays the move knight to e4, which is the first real significant inaccuracy of the game. When in doubt, don't move the same piece twice in the opening. The simple knight to f3 would have maintained equality, supporting e5. And if you want to see what ideal play from both sides looks like, then things can get real engine real quick with queen to a5, queen to d5, challenging the queen, adding some defense to e5. So the black queen drops back to c7, and we can delve even deeper into computer land with knight to b5, hitting the queen, queen back to a5 check, bishop to d2, queen to b6, c5, and things are looking pretty nutty. We're way out of opening theory here, but the engine's giving us double zeros, total equality, as we stare into the face of chess perfection. But getting back to the realm of mere mortals, where Rene, in this position, played the relatively crude knight to e4, applying some pressure to d6, Bobby now comes up with a very strong response. Bishop to f5, attacking the knight, to which white's best response is to take on d6. This was not played in the game, but it is white's best chance. He's momentarily jumped two pawns ahead in material, but it won't last. The critical line goes knight takes d6, queen takes d6. When black could trade queens and then recover one of his pawns with bishop takes b2 with a significant advantage, but even stronger here seems to be queen to e8, planning rook to d8, hitting the queen, and then looking to break things open with f6 to exploit the white king who is still stuck in the center. And white might survive this, but it's not gonna be a walk in the park. But the move played in the game after bishop to f5 attacking the knight, instead of the absolutely necessary knight takes d6, was knight to g3, which, like most losing blunders played by strong players, doesn't look nearly as bad as it is. White is hitting the bishop on f5, but black's position is such that he doesn't even have to do anything about it. Strongest is queen to c7, preparing rook to d8, while putting more pressure on the e5 pawn, which white still isn't gonna be able to trade off without running into big trouble. Since he's left his king in the center for way too long, while playing against Bobby Fischer, I mean, as brutally as I would surely be defeated if I had ever had the opportunity to play against Fischer, one thing I would not do is leave my king uncastled for even one single move more than was absolutely necessary. But that's just me. Bobby now continues with a move that is slightly inferior to queen c7, according to the engine, though still fully winning, bishop to e6, after which the engine is recommending that white should put his knight back to e4, although it can't seem to make up its mind on whether that move is losing or hopelessly losing, so I'll spare you the details and forge ahead with Rene's next move, knight to f3, which looks very sensible, although played much too late. And here we get a little glimpse of Fisher's human side. He plays queen to c7, which at this point is an inaccuracy. It's actually best to capture on e5 now, allowing the trade of queens with queen takes d8 and rook takes d8, which doesn't get white out of his predicament, even if he follows up by taking on e5 and trading off a pair of knights. Black has way too much activity with his remaining pieces. Now there is this move bishop to c5, threatening to win the exchange, which black doesn't have a great way to prevent, but he's winning anyway after this rather messy engine line which goes e takes f4, knight to e2, knight to f6, the bishop captures on f8, we have bishop takes f8, after which black's extra pawn and lead in development give him such strong compensation for the lost exchange that the engine is saying white shouldn't even take on f4, or play rook to d1, but instead recommends a3 to prevent bishop to b4 from coming with check, but everything's losing here. Rook to e8 is next, lining up with the white king, and white is still in big trouble. And there's some alternative variations along the way that I skipped over, but understandably, Bobby wanted to avoid all this. He wasn't eager to sack the exchange and get into any messy endgame complications, or maybe his compensation wasn't so clear. And so, in this position, he rejects the objectively strongest move, d takes e5, and instead goes for queen to c7, avoiding the queen exchange. And this move would be much stronger than it is, and probably totally winning, as opposed to possibly winning, if not for a brilliant response now available to white, which Rene didn't find. But take a moment if you'd like to try to spot it, white's best move, 
The only move that really keeps him in the game, the move is F5, which is a perfect demonstration of how to stop playing like a human and start playing like a freaking engine. Lesson one, if you see a pawn break and it looks good, don't prepare it, just play it. Play it first, then prepare. And you'll probably get crushed most of the time, since most pawn pushes do need proper support. But in situations like this, you'll look like a genius. So anyway, what's going on here? Well, black should probably take the pawn. I mean, what else are you gonna do? Retreat the bishop and then allow e6 or f6? That's no good. So bishop takes f5 is best, and after knight takes f5, g takes f5, and bishop to d3, white's ready to play bishop takes f5. Ready to castle? Some of the pawn cover has been removed from the black king, and black still has an advantage after d takes e5, bishop takes f5, but white has a lot of life left in this position and good reason to play on. But let's contrast this with Rene's move, which was queen to b1. Okay, you gotta hand it to him. He's got the right idea, looking for that f pawn break and thinking it needs to be supported by the queen. But here it's coming just one move too late because Bobby is able to strike first with d takes e5. Again, you don't wanna capture on e5 as white, since if you trade down on that square, you're just helping black get his queen to e5, pinning the bishop on e3, eyeing b2. It's pretty clear how that's going to end. So Rene plays the better move, pushing forward with f5, hitting the bishop, and hoping to use black's e5 pawn as sort of a shield for his king along this e-file, which he does not want opened until he is safely castled. And here Bobby plays a move that is very understandable from a human point of view, he doesn't want to allow white to create any needless complications, and so he plays the move e4, which is winning. But even more crushing would have been g takes f5, after which the most critical line goes knight takes f5, bishop takes, queen takes on f5. When the white queen is getting active and has some possible check mating threats in the air, however, black now has knight to d6, with tempo on the queen, who can go to g4, pinning the bishop and threatening bishop to h6, but then the simplest is probably just f5. Planning f4 or e4, depending on where the white queen goes, and white's superficial check mating threats can easily be dealt with, while black's powerful pawn duo and continued attacking prospects cannot be. But let's contrast this with Fisher's move. e4, attacking the knight on f3, and looking to open up some lines, offering white the e-pawn, which would clear the e-file, He's also activating his dark squared bishop. So Rene declines capturing the pawn, although his best chance was actually to take with the queen. After which Fisher has g takes f5. When white cannot take on f5 with the knight, or else queen to a5 check, will immediately win the piece. So apparently that was another point of Fisher pushing the e-pawn, clearing this rank. So what white should play here is queen to f4, offering the trade of queens, which black should really accept. It's the only way to maintain a win. The engine is giving queen takes queen, followed by bishop takes b2, and then meeting rook to b1 with bishop to c3 check, when black's extra pawn and more active pieces should be enough to win. Though it's not gonna be simple. If he instead avoids the queen trade and allows the white queen to stay on f4, then there's always the danger that white will start creating threats to the black king, whose pawn cover has been compromised. So this line was the best chance for white, but let's look at Rene's move. After Bobby pushed his pawn to e4, which is to capture the bishop with f takes e6. Bobby of course responds by capturing the knight on f3, and after g takes f3, how many of us as black would want to just take on e6? opening a file for the rook. What could be more natural? But Bobby sees that f5 is even stronger, threatening f4 with the fork, hence the move f4 from Rene, but now here comes knight to f6, targeting the newly created holes on e4 and g4 as a consequence of white's pawn push to f4. Now e4 is adequately covered for the moment by the queen and the knight, hence the move bishop to e2, preparing to capture on g4, if black puts his knight there. Bobby continues rook f to e8, going after the e6 pawn, which cannot be defended. And so Rene plays king to f2, just hoping to hold the fort down. He's thinking this offers him better chances than castling, since it adds defense to the bishop on e3, which will be under fire after rook takes e6, now played by Bobby. We have rook to e1, adding more support, so that after rook a to e8, Rene can play bishop to f3, leaving his bishop on e3 defended twice. And for the moment, 
Everything seems, what's the word? I'm not gonna say it looks good for White here, but it seems like he might be able to struggle on for a bit. But in this position, Bobby Fischer finds a stunning tactical sequence that ends the game in only three moves. So if you've never seen this game before, then I implore you to pause the video and have a look. The first two moves of this tactical brilliancy are not that hard to find, but the third move is really something else. And it's stunning evidence of Bobby Fischer's incredible board vision. So here we go. The combination begins with rook takes e3. And after rook takes e3, rook takes e3, and king takes e3, the white king has been drawn out into the open a bit at the cost of a sacrificed exchange. So congratulations to anyone who calculated this far. But how does black now wrap things up? Now, if you remember anything at all about this video's title, thumbnail, or introduction, then you probably already know what the move is. But if you don't, then go ahead and pause the video again and see if you can spot the killer move that Bobby Fischer now unleashes to immediately end the game. Here it comes. The move is Queen takes F4 check, prompting immediate resignation by Rene Letelier Martner, who to his utter horror realized that King takes F4 will run into bishop to h6, checkmate. Beautiful. Just look at those black pieces working together to cover all the white king's squares. Now, of course, white wasn't forced to take the queen. And so if we back up to this position, we see that the king can instead retreat. But nevertheless, black still has checkmate in 14 moves or less. So let's take a quick look at that. Best for black is king to f2. We get knight to g4 check. The bishop is pinned, cannot capture. So play continues king to g2, knight to e3 check, king back to f2 to keep defense of the bishop. But here comes knight to d4, hitting that bishop a second time. So if you wanna get mated in 11 moves, you gotta sack the queen with queen to d1. But if you wanna get mated in 10, then you play queen to h1. But after knight to g4 check, it is not possible for white to keep his bishop doubly protected. Since if king to g2, then queen takes bishop check, is gonna be mate in three. So the mate in nine from here goes as follows. King to f1, knight takes f3, knight to e2, queen to e3, queen to g2, knight g takes h2 check. You gotta sack the queen. The knight is replaced with check. We get king to e1, bishop to f6, c5, didn't really matter what white played here, because here comes bishop to h4 check, king to d1, queen to d3 check, king to c1, bishop to g5 check, knight to f4, and bishop takes f4 check mate. So I hope you enjoyed that brutal yet elegant finish to one of Fisher's most epic masterpieces. And now, as promised, I'm gonna show you a tactical sequence that you might find even more beautiful and more delightfully unexpected than the one you just witnessed. It's from one of my own games that I played a few years back, and it contains a tactical sequence that I consider to be among my greatest missed opportunities. Second only to not buying Bitcoin in 2014, of course. I discovered this amazing combination during my post-mortem analysis of the game using Stockfish like I always do. I was playing black and in this position where white had just moved his bishop from C3 to D2, the engine suddenly switched its evaluation from thinking the position was a dead draw to now saying that black is totally winning which completely baffled me. Obviously, if I take the bishop on d2, then that removes defense from the a7 square. Then white just pushes the pawn, and how am I stopping him from getting another queen? I'm not. So take a look at the position here. See if you can spot black's winning move. Give yourself five minutes, 10 minutes, even an hour. If you can find it, and be honest, no engines, let me know in the comments, and let me know what your rating is, because this is not an obvious move. You ready for it? Here it comes. It's simply bishop takes d2. But hold on, didn't we just decide that after a7, black has no defense against the queening of the pawn? Well, that is true. White is gonna get his shiny new queen, but black doesn't care because he has an incredible follow-up. Pause the video again if you'd like, try to find it. It's a weird looking move. Here it is, bishop to e1. What on earth does that do? Well, first of all, if white takes the bishop, we can rule that out because black just grabs on a7 and then he's just gonna win with his extra pawns. Of course, white's not gonna do that when he can simply promote his pawn and get a new queen like so. 
But this gives black an incredible forced mate in three moves with queen to f1 check, king to h2, bishop to g3 check. The king's got to take on g3. It's the only move. After which, queen to f4 is a beautiful dovetailed checkmate, as it's called, since this configuration is supposed to resemble a dove's tail. So how about that? Have you ever seen a combination so pretty and unexpected with so few pieces left on the board? I don't think I ever have, but I want to back up for just a second to this position after the move bishop to e1. Since here, some of you might be wondering, well, what if white doesn't push the pawn or take the bishop and instead tries to do something to prevent that checkmate? In that case, one of two things is going to happen. Either the king is going to have to step onto the g1 square, either immediately or after king to h2 followed by queen to f4 check when g3 leads to a rapid mate. So king to g1 would really be necessary. And once the king gets onto that square, there's going to be bishop to f2 check, followed by bishop takes a7. And again, black will win with the extra pawns. Now, white can keep his king on the light squares. Let's say you play something like h4 to give the king the h3 square so that dovetailed mate isn't possible. But here, there's just queen to f1 check, forcing the king onto h2, after which bishop to g3 check will win the white queen. So there you have it, two fantastic combinations, one played by the great Bobby Fischer, the other discovered by the mighty Stockfish. So that's it for today. As always, thanks for watching to the very end. That always helps the channel, as well as your subscription and your hitting of that like button, if it feels right, and I will see you very soon.